Good morning. How is everybody? Are there any announcements we need to make other than what's on the announcement sheet or things we don't know about? All right. I don't know of any. I really haven't looked at it, to be honest. I don't know of anything different myself. Do remember those folks. Remember the Dobbs family, especially today. They'll be going through their services. And all the others that are not feeling well. Good to see Charles and Nancy today. They're with us. These visitors from West Tennessee, I don't know who they are. Wonderful little girl. Yesterday, and well, actually what it is, is it's Ethan's birthday. So yesterday, so I won't tell you how old he is, but he was born in 1990. So you can figure it out. <laughs> but um, we went to Gentry's Farm in Franklin. And uh, if you've got grandchildren or great-grandchildren, that is a wonderful place to go. It was really, uh, it, was, it was good value for, for your money, and uh, so it was enjoyable. And the only problem was is that it was a little hot, and that's not their fault. But it was really pretty and well-maintained, and we enjoyed it. So if you're looking for somewhere to go, uh, we would recommend that. I didn't get anything for that, but if you go, you tell them that I publicized for them. So <laughs> kick ends up. No, just kidding. Anything else? All right. We're beginning a, a different study today. We finished First Corinthians last week. We're going to try this. Uh, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And, and hopefully it will work for you. It's uh, a study of difficult passages. Now, you know, some folks may look at that and say, there's no passage that's difficult. Okay, I can give you some. You try to explain them to me. <laughs> We're going to look at different verses that are deemed by different ones difficult. Now, I'm going to be using actually several different sources uh, for this study and several different books that uh, have kind of this theme of difficult passages. Difficult passages are difficult for many different reasons. Some of them are difficult because of the fact that we don't have the historical context. And we can, through reading books that uh, tell us about those times that have studied them. But at the same time, too, as just a sort of a, a person just reading and studying the Bible, you say, I don't understand this. And part of it is because of the historical context. Sometimes passages are difficult because uh, we hear them and have heard them all of our lives. But we've heard them out of context. And we haven't heard them really within the context that they that they are. I think one example of that really is the sermon last Sunday. We looked at Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But then when we put it within the context of Philippians 4, it helps us to understand. That's not a difficult passage, by the way, but it helps us to understand that. Well, sometimes we have heard verses quoted out of context by many different individuals. Let me give you an example of a young lady years ago called me. She was not a member of the church, by the way. She was uh, someone that was needing some help in a particular area. And as we were talking, I, I told her, and this was over the phone, I told her of her where she stood and what the Bible said. And uh, she did not like what I had to say. And I understand that. I didn't try to hurt her feelings. I wasn't not trying to hurt her feelings. But understood that her life and the way the Bible reads were two different things. And as we were talking, and she realized what I was saying and really reading out of the Bible to her, she finally, this is what she said, judge not that you be not judged, and hung up the phone. Well, that's a great passage. It didn't fit the way she was using it. And so sometimes passages are difficult because of 
the fact we've heard it that way and they've always been used. And that leads us to a third reason that some passages are difficult is because we, we, we've taken them out of context and we need to study them within the context in which they are. Sometimes passages are difficult because our Bible view is skewed. Now, one of those, I think you'll see an example of that this morning in one of the passages that we're going to study. You're going to say, well, you know, I don't believe that way. Yes, but there are those that do. Well, why? Well, for various reasons and various teachings that they have drawn from here, there, and yonder, it's skewed. Their their biblical view is skewed. And, and so consequently, they have made passages more difficult even for us as we look at them and as we study them. And there's a lot of other reasons, you know. John 6, I think, is a great example. When Jesus had laid out for those to whom he was talking there about uh, eating flesh and drinking blood, which is probably one of the verses or one of the texts that we'll talk about, which was basically, so just let me kind of paraphrase it here, even though we may study it later, is talking about commitment, conviction and commitment to the Lord. And there were those then, if you keep reading the text, there are those then that, that uh, as Jesus is addressing, there are those that are beginning to part. And Jesus asked this simple question, will you also go away? Lord, to whom shall we go for you have the words of life? But remember what was told to Jesus. Lord, this is a hard saying. Difficult. Why was it difficult to them? It was difficult to them because not so much what was said, but what stood behind it. We have to remember that as well. So difficult passages, and you may run into some, by the way, that leads me to a thought that, that I had uh, this week in thinking about this class even further and studying for it. If you have a difficult passage, this class will be studying New Testament. I think we're going to try it on Wednesday nights in the Old Testament. But uh, So if you have a, a New Testament passage that is difficult for you, uh, write it down, sign it so that I understand who gave it to me and uh, so I don't forget, and, and just tell me, you know, I'm having difficulty with this passage, and we'll see what we can do to incorporate it in our study. I, I'm somewhat going to go systematically. In other words, the, the two or three that we're going to look at this morning are from Matthew. But I can, we can jump around. That's not a big deal. What I'm going to try to do is ultimately tell you what you need to study for next week. And that will, will hopefully help you in, in that endeavor. But anyway, we then need to, since Jerry Barber's here, no, actually I thought of this before Jerry showed up. I think we need to, to cover a couple of two or three rules with regards to, to this class. I want you to speak up. I want you to have your say, and you may disagree with me. And that's fine. That's fine. You can disagree with me. We're going to sort of adopt the the old restoration plea of in matters of faith, unity, in matters of opinion, liberty, and all things love. Uh, you can disagree and you can have your say, and I'll be glad to let you have your say. I may still disagree with you, but you can still have your say. That's part of part of being blessed to be in America, number one. But that's just, I think, the right of of every Christian, every child of God. So we can disagree, and we are going to disagree without being disagreeable. And like I say, in matters of faith, where the Bible says this is what it is, this is what it is. I can't change that. You can't either. But in matters of opinion, and there's going to be some in some of these, we'll just let your opinion stay with you. I mean, you can tell it by all means, but my opinion will stay with me and, and we won't get mad at each other. We still love each other. And if you want to give me a hug after class, as long as you don't have COVID, I'll hug you. But if you got COVID, stay away. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'll hug you anyway. So having said all that, look in Matthew chapter five, Matthew chapter five. And if you don't like this study, please tell me. I mean, I'd hate on going through the rest of the year with this. So we won't cover every difficult passage. But if, uh, if, if you don't like it, tell me. If you like it, you can tell me. You, you won't hurt my feelings if you tell me as well. In Matthew chapter 5, though, 
What is this sermon often referred to as? Sermon on the Mount. In this sermon, Jesus is fairly early in his ministry. And he preaches a sermon. Now, Matthew is interesting because Matthew has some five different sermons of Jesus. Really, Matthew does more of that than, than Mark, Luke, or John does. Matthew tend to group things together. You know, if you really think about it, just think for just a second because we're probably all familiar with this. In what we call the Beatitudes, those first, you know, blessed are you, so forth and so on, uh, right there at the beginning. Right there they are in Matthew, all tightly knit together, if you will. But where are they in Luke? Scattered throughout, right? Well, it's led some folks to say Matthew grouped, and so therefore this is really not a sermon. This is a compilation of Jesus' teachings. Could be true. I don't believe it. I believe it was a sermon preached. Do we have all of the sermon? I don't know. It doesn't qualify for a 30-minute sermon, so I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, I do believe that Jesus could use his teaching more than once. In other words, he could have used these Beatitudes at different times, like Luke has them. You can use something as a preacher more than once. Doesn't, uh, you know... As as I told you the story about my secretary in Pomona, she said she asked me once. She said, "Why do you think everybody remembers everything you say?" And that's right. Folks forget. Folks need to be remember reminded. At times, things are addressed that that need to be addressed again. And when you look at Jesus, where did he say this? You know, Jesus had a, a Galilean ministry. Jesus had a Judean ministry different places. So it could be that he used things in the Sermon on the Mount more than once. The real theme, as I see it, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Sermon on the Mount, the real theme is kingdom living. When you stop and think about what Matthew tries to do, excuse me, let me back up. What I believe Matthew does in his account of the gospel, and, uh, and remember, we often say, you know, the gospel, it's, it's really in the Greek, it's the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew. Gospel according to Luke. It's not Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. It's only one gospel. Matthew's account of the gospel. But in the Sermon on the Mount, or in the book itself, excuse me, let me back up, in the book itself is the portrait of Jesus as king. And so in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he says, okay, here's kingdom living. Here's, here's what you do. And you say, well, preacher, I've always thought the kingdom's the church. That's right. But who and what's the church? Us, right? Christians. So he tells us then really how to live in the Sermon on the Mount. And as he gets into the, the, the Beatitudes, he talks about here's the state of happiness. Here's what you do. Then he talks about the Christian influence. He talks about light and salt and you're the salt of the earth and you're a light that's supposed to be shining before others. And then he makes a statement in verse 17. Do not think that I am that I came, excuse me, to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That our text for at least and we by by the way, we will probably cover more than one text every class. We'll probably shoot at three, probably cover two, depend and we may cover four, depending on you know how much discussion we need. But this is the one that I want to start with. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In Jesus' day, in Jesus' time, and with Jesus' teaching, there were a lot of questions about Jesus. Who is he? 
What is he? Where did he come from? He's different. You know, he's not a Pharisee. He's not a Sadducee. He's not even a zealot. Doesn't claim to be an Essene, so any of the groups, major or minor, if you will. Who is he? Where did he get this power? How is he able to do these miracles? There was a, there were a lot of questions about about Jesus, and here's a question: He seems to reject the Old Testament. And we, if we're living in that day, are questioning him. Why? Because we're holding to the Old Testament. That's our law. That's our message from God. We need that message. If we're a Jewish individual standing, listening to this sermon already. Because it's interesting because he takes a turn now in this sermon. And he's going to be talking about, you have heard that it has been said. And he's going to take some Old Testament passages that have been twisted, perverted by by false teachers or folks that meant well but just didn't know exactly what they were doing or saying, and twist those things to, to fit what they wanted it to fit. And so he's going to be teaching something that is different from the law. And as it is different from the law, folks are saying, this Jesus, why do I need to listen to him? And he comes and he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to destroy it. I didn't come to take it away from the standpoint of of tearing it down. The idea of destroy there is the idea. I didn't come to tear it down. I came to fulfill it. Now, what comes to your mind with the idea of fulfilling something? Anybody? Huh? Finish it out. There you go. Yeah. I want to finish it out. And that's his purpose. But there are those that question that even today. You might say, nobody questions that. Oh, yes. There are folks that question the fact of did Jesus destroy the law or did he fulfill it? Fulfilling it is the idea of he he says, I came to finish it out. It's the idea of of obeying the commands, make good on on its promises, fulfilling every promise, uh, prophecy about it. Galatians chapter 3, somebody that uh, feels... I guess frisky this morning. Galatians 3, verse 24. Somebody want to read that for us? If not, I'll read it. But Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. It says what? The law was our what? I bet we got more than one version here. Our guardian, ESV. What does your version say? Tutor. Tutor. Teacher. No, it doesn't. (laughs) It says schoolmaster, probably. Schoolmaster. Yeah. Anybody else? Different version. Our tutor, our teacher, our schoolmaster. It's the idea, then, of... It's teaching us. The law was a teacher to bring us to a point in time. The law, let's go back and understand with regards to the law. Not ask you to read this, but turn with me. And by the way, we probably do a considerable amount of turning. But the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with those who are 
here today, all of us who are alive. The covenant, the old law, was given to the children of Israel then. That's what Moses is saying. He says the old law was given to a specific people, and it was to be given for a specific time. If you're still stuck in Galatians, if you look in chapter 3, verse 19, the law was just for a specific time. Specific people for a specific time wasn't meant to last forever. There are those today that still hold that we are bound under the old law. But Jesus said, I came to fulfill it. I came to finish it out. We're no longer bound under it. Jesus finished out the old law. Now, now, here presents a problem for some. Not for me, but for some. Okay? And I'm going to kind of leave a little bit of this dangling because I'm going to cover a little bit of it in the sermon this morning. But there are those then that say, okay, Jesus lived under the old law because, as we'll see in just a second, when did the old law cease to be? Colossians 2.14. At the cross, right? The old law was taken away at the cross. And so for some, there is teaching for some that says that little page, that little white page that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament in your Bible is in the wrong place. They'll tell you it needs to be not between Malachi and Matthew, but it needs to be between John and Acts. And as a matter of fact, they'll even carry it as far as to part of Acts 1, and some will say Acts 2. But that's where that white page should be. I don't agree with that at all. But there are those that say that. Jesus, in fulfilling the law, was also at the same time doing what? Giving a new law, right? Teaching a new teaching. And that's why folks were were somewhat puzzled by him. Now you imagine you're you're there at Sermon on the Mount. And more than likely, if custom followed as it seemingly did, because we we believe that Jesus was sitting down. It's interesting. In that day, the preacher sat and the audience for the most part stood. You're standing there and you're listening to Jesus in, in a a really a great amphitheater almost where his voice would carry. And you hear him, you, you hear him begin with these beatitudes and then talk about this idea of influence. And you know some of the things that he's already taught and you're wondering, and now he prefaces what he's fixing to say, what he's about to say with this idea of, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. But in fulfilling it, Finish it out. He finished all the prophecies. You know, think about all the prophecies that there were about Jesus and all the teachings about one that was to come. He says, I'm fulfilling that. He left a teaching. And so we're reminded to listen to the doctrine of Jesus. Now, I'm going to, you can ask questions and that's fine, but I'm going to kind of leave some of that hanging because some of that is in the sermon this morning and don't want you to go to sleep. I probably would, will, but you don't during the sermon. It'll be all right. Jesus then wants you to understand that the law is no more. Well, let's look at a couple of passages. We already looked at Colossians 2. Let's look in Romans 7. Any questions or comments before we before I look at this? We're still in the same point, but Paul wrote to the church at Rome, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Paul says we're no longer under the law. Talking about the old law. Now, once again simple passage made difficult because there are those that have taken Romans 7 out of context, well, all, excuse me, all of Romans out of context and have said this idea of the law is law itself. No, Paul, go back and read context. You know, I told you 
uh, last Sunday, one of the purposes for this class is to kind of introduce you or remind you of, of things that you already know, but how to study. You've got to read the context. What's the immediate context? What's the greater context? Paul in the book of Romans is not condemning the law from the standpoint of following God, but he's saying we're no longer under the old law. The Old Testament. So it was taken away. If you want a couple of other passages to look at in your study, Ephesians 2, verse 15, and Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 might help you. But here's the problem. There are those, as we said, that still teach, well, okay, I believe we're under the old law. From a logical standpoint, from a scriptural standpoint, we said, okay, Jesus said, I came to fill it, to finish it out. He did that. He took it away at the cross. But there's some say, no, we're still under the law. But, okay, you look at it from a versus standpoint, we've already shown, but look at it from a logical standpoint. If that be true, how much then of the old law should we follow? There's the logical question that must arise. In other words, am I only to keep the Sabbath day? That's all I have to get have to keep. Or am I only bound to keep the Ten Commandments? Which by the way has the Sabbath day in it. Or Am I to keep the holy days? Or am I to keep the idea of the priesthood, the high priesthood, high priest, excuse me, the priesthood? Am I to keep that? Am I to keep sacrifices? Am I to offer animal sacrifices? Am I to bring uh, the the fatted calf, if you will, uh, to allow the priest to offer as a sacrifice? Do you see the logical question? The logical question is, if I am bound to the law, I'm bound to all of it, not part of it. Jesus said, though, he says, I came to fulfill the law. You know, in reading and studying about this, was, this was, I don't know, just kind of, as I was reading somebody, I thought that was, in, that was interesting. They made the statement, they said, if we're to keep part of the, or we're to keep all of the law, then we need to go back to stoning blasphemous people. And we don't do that, thankfully. But you see the problem, the idea of the Passover and circumcision. We've talked about in classes before, circumcision, <laughs> excuse me, is, is uh, something that now is done medically for uh, to male children, male babies, but it's done for medical reasons, not for keeping of the law. And so can one do it? We've talked about that. Yes. Do they have to? No. Is it wise? Probably so. But what's our conclusion? Well, Jesus fulfilled the law. We're not under it. We're not to, to be bound by it. It was taken away. But there is value. There is value in the Old Testament. You remember a while ago we said that the law was our teacher, our tutor, our schoolmaster. What did they do? They taught us. They taught us. You ever think about your teachers that you had in the past? Why should we? You know why? Because we all talk about them. <laughs> we all talk about. Them. Yeah, I remember Miss So and So. I was was. Uh, Typing something in my computer the other day, and I thought about Miss Ballou. Miss Ballou was my typing teacher. They don't, what's it now? Keyboarding? Is that what they call it? You know, but we call typing. Miss Ballou's a member of the church, and she was a pretty good lady. We ran her crazy, but she was pretty, pretty sweet lady. She went to church with me, so I didn't get away with anything in her class. Had her for accounting and for, for uh, typing, and, and, but I thought about her. We all do that. We all, we all think about folks of the past. Well, what, what's the value of the Old Testament? Well, it teaches us. It teaches us. We still have skills. We still have abilities. We still have things we do today. 
because of our teachers. And so our teachers teach us just as the Old Testament taught us. It still teaches us today. What did Paul say in Romans 15, 4 was the value in the Old Testament? Do you remember? Things that were written before time were written for our what? Learning. We, through patience and admonition of the scriptures, that we might have hope. It's written for our learning. Thus our schoolmaster teaches us. And in many ways, and if you if you want to look at another passage right quick, let's look at 1 Corinthians 10. We just studied, you remember, 1 Corinthians? But do you remember in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, the context there is talking about the Old Testament? And it makes this statement. Now, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. These things became our examples. The Old Testament has a lot of pictures, if you will. You know, on Wednesday nights in the auditorium class, we're right now really studying a, a narrative. We're studying history. First, we're studying the book of First Samuel. And it's there's not a lot of just, you know, thou shalt and thou shalt not. There's some good principles in there. And we try to draw those out as we end each chapter, what some practical applications from this chapter, something that we can learn, that we can build on in our life from that chapter. Those stories, important to understanding the history of even to this point in day. But those are stories that fit our lives. And so we can learn a lot. He says, it's our example. If you're still there in 1 Corinthians, look in chapter 10, look in verse 11. Now, these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. They were written for us, and they illustrate. You know, you can... You can go back and you can look in the, the life of David as we've begun studying that in First Samuel because we see the, the beginning of it and we see him running and we see we see we saw this past Wednesday night the fear of his fellow soldiers and, and when they were told to go and they didn't want to go. And we talked a little bit about fear. And, and you, you get a lot of illustrative material there that truly fits us that are under the, the New Testament law. Something somebody likes to say before we go on. Well, here we ask this question then. Ultimately, we have to ask ourselves in life, who do we listen to? Because we listen to a lot of people. I don't know who you listen to today because I don't know all of your habits in your homes, but... You listen to somebody. There, are, There is somebody or several somebodies that you listen to that you really pay attention to what they have to say. You know, in, in my day of growing up, it was whatever Walter Cronkite said, right? And then it kind of became Paul Harvey, whatever they said. Those were the things you listened to. And now we have many voices out there. And you can go to Spotify. You can People, ha people have uh, blogs. And people people do podcasts. I, I don't know anybody that does one, does it well. But we have podcasts, and people listen to I listen to podcasts. And people listen to those podcasts, and they follow what they have to say. By the way, I was pointing at Jerry. Jerry has a very good one. If you don't know how to get it or, or um, you don't know what it is, or, or talk to Jerry. You, you'll talk to him, won't you? And uh, and you need to listen to it. It's good. But um, we we have many voices out there. Ultimately, how do we get the voice? And who do we listen to? Well, those that I listen to, I listen to for the reasons that um, I agree with them, for the most part. You the same. But the ultimate one we listen to is the Lord. And so that's really the teaching of that. Anything else? Way too long on that. All right, well, stay in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. I think maybe we can finish this one right quick. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 33. 
Again, you have heard that it is said. Remember I told you that, yeah, I should have, I'm sorry, in your own study, go back and read verse 18 with what I've said. And I should have used that, but anyway, we'll go on to this. Remember we said that, that Jesus, part of his sermon, you could look at it, maybe third point, fourth point in his sermon was, you've heard that it's been said. But I say unto you, things had gotten twisted in the law. Let's just read it. Matthew chapter 5, let's begin in verse 33, this little paragraph, if you will. Again, you've heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Jewish teaching by Jesus' time had become perverted. It had become convoluted, and folks had changed parts of the law. Probably not intentionally, but some maybe so. They had changed the law on several different things. Go back and read this section of the Sermon on the Mount. And as they changed those things, those things then became what you always did, right? You've heard, I know you've all heard the old story, and I'll, but I'll tell it again, but I'll tell it quickly, and sh I'll shorten it a little bit. It's a preacher story of the, the, the young girl that, you know, she hadn't been married long, and she goes to cook a ham. And uh, when she does, she cuts off the, the back end of the ham, and she puts, you know, both pieces, she puts them in the oven, and her husband, her new husband, oh, greatest ham he's ever eaten. He just loves it to death and, and thinks the world of it. And, and he says, but I got a question. And she says, yeah, what's the question? And he says, well, why didn't you cut the back end off and, and cut it off and put it in two, you put it in two pans and put it in up. Why'd you do that? She said, well, I don't know. She said, mom always did. What? Can we ask mama? So they called mama. Mama, you know. You've always cut the, yeah. Well, why did you do that? I don't know. Grandma always did. So grandma was still alive. They called grandma. Grandma, you cut the back end of your ham off for you. Yeah. Put it in two different pans. Yeah. Why do you do that? Because I didn't have a pan big enough for, for that one ham. So I had to cut it in two. Well, that's, you know, that's an old, old preacher story. But things get changed that way in families, don't they? What things happen with regards to the old law. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Here's part of the law. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. Okay. Now, by the time you get to the New Testament time, Jesus says there are folks that are taking oaths. But they're taking oaths and they're not keeping what they say. In other words, they were making an oath and if they swore, if they swore an oath, and they swore it in the name other than God. They didn't have to keep what they promised. I wouldn't ask you, but how many of you this week just think, just so it's somewhat rhetorical. How many of you made a promise this week? Maybe you made it to yourself. Maybe you made it to your kids, your grandkids. Maybe you made it to your neighbor. Maybe you made it to a friend that lives across town, but you talk to on the phone quite often. But you made a promise, whatever it was. Now imagine, let's say you made this promise to someone else other than yourself. Imagine this week comes reckoning time and you have to keep that promise. Maybe you promised them, let's just use it for instance. Let's, let's get it more specific so we're clear. You make a promise to them, and your promise is, I'll come see you on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. And that's your promise. So Tuesday at 9 o'clock, they are all prepared for you to come to their house. 
I mean, they've worked all weekend long cleaning it up. They went out to the grocery store. They bought some extra food to, to fix for you. They've prepared a special little lunch for you. And you don't show up. And so by 11 o'clock, they call you and they say, hey, where are you? Sitting at home. Why are you sitting at home? You said you was going to come see me today. Oh, no. You know, if I had said, and if I had said, I'm going to come and promised it by God, I'd be there. But because I didn't promise it by God, I don't have to be there. That's the problem that the Jewish folks were having at that time. If they didn't make, if they didn't swear an oath by God, they could swear it by, as Jesus said, you could swear it by, you know, your haircut or whatever. They they thought they didn't have to keep it. And so there was a problem, you might say, with lack of honesty. Now, here comes part of the problem. We have to ask ourselves, are oaths and can oaths be used with God's approval. Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice what Paul does. In chapter one, this is Second Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-three. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul. In other words, he's placed an oath, and he's calling upon the folks at Corinth to say, "Hey, look, I, I'm fulfilling this." If you want another passage, Galatians chapter one, verse twenty. Oaths are used with with God's approval. In other words, yeah, certain oaths, Jesus responded to the Sanhedrin council. Go back, if you're still in Matthew, now go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 63. Well, let's, let's, I tell you what, read, uh, let's read beginning, let's read beginning in verse 59. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is what is it these men testify against you? And Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put your you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus responded to an oath. Jesus evidently then, as he responded to this oath, It's telling us it's okay. The import then, as we go back to Matthew 5, verse 33, the import then is what is Jesus saying to these folks? What is he telling them? Is he telling them you can't take an oath? Can you go to, by the way, can you go to court of law? Put your hand on the Bible, raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, now they've changed a little bit. It used to be, you know, do you swear to tell the whole truth nothing but the truth but up to God? Now you can get them to say, do you swear, or, and some of them do, do you swear or affirm? Well, the import of Matthew 5 is basically to say, whatever you say, you keep your word. You keep your word, even to your own heart. Really? Yeah, well, there's a lot I, I wanted to say about this, but let me just give you one passage. Look in Psalm eight, uh, Psalm 15, excuse me. Psalm 15. And verse 4. Beginning in Psalm 15, verse 1, 
the psalmist says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle and who will dwell in your holy hill? In other words, the psalmist begins by asking the question, Lord, who in the world is going to enter into heaven? And he gives a lot of qualifications here. And in verse 4, he says, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fears the Lord, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He keeps his word. There are times in which we're going to make promises to people and things are really going to come up in our life that we're not going to be able to keep those promises. We need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge, hey, you know, I promised you this. I'm not able to do it. Here's the reason. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But if I promised you something, then I need to keep that promise. That's really what's being said. I'd like to say more, but but I can't. But here's here's one of the great principles to pull out of this. And that is, is to ask yourself, okay, do we follow a tradition or do we follow the law of God? Don't lie. Speak truth to every man with his neighbor. I had a, a bad habit, I guess, for lack of a better term, years ago, not that many years ago, of when I would begin to say something, I'd say, I'm going to tell you the truth. And I had a good brother that to talk to me and he said, Paul, he says, you're a preacher. And he said, I hope everything you say is the truth. And I said, well, it is. He says, well, then why do you say that? And I said, well, it's redundant, but, uh, you know, it's almost the idea. It's not exactly the same as taking an oath. Can we take an oath? Can we take an oath to, um, in a court of law? Can we take an oath? Uh, sometimes now we have signed things to you. You probably sign a lot of things that you take an oath. On. I, I've signed something for somebody Three weeks ago, I guess, uh, I signed something for somebody that basically, if you read the paragraph, it, I was taking an oath that what I was signing was correct, which it was. And so, um, but I was sort of a witness then to things. And, and can you do that? Sure. Sure. Well, it says don't, don't, don't swear. No, it's what it's saying here is be sure that you're honest. Jesus wanted his followers to be what? The Jewish folks had turned out not to be. He wanted them to be honest. Tell the truth. Let your yes be yes and your nay be what? Nay. Tell the truth. Anything else? Okay, well, let me tell you where you, where you need to read. Read the next paragraph in Matthew 5. And then if we have time, we're going to cover, just read Matthew 12 and Matthew 18. We're going to cover two out of those as well. So we'll try to cover two to three. And like I say, if you have any, I'll be glad to take those and see what I can do to help us out. And hopefully this will be enjoyable. If it's not, like I say, tell me. Be glad to adapt or change. I'm not stuck. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, this beautiful sunshine that we have for this wonderful weather in this time of year. We're thankful that you love us and watch over us, and we're thankful that you have given us everything that we have, and we know that, and we're thankful for it, and we're thankful for all that we have. We ask now that you be with us as we enter into this period of worship, that we'll truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Watch over us, bless us, keep us, and hold us as you hold, as we hold to you. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you all. Y'all have a great, great week.